So on that, let's look at cardio training first and say, you know, how would you put someone on a program to help on the cardio side? Once we've established that a person, you know, has the basics, you know, they're, they're not immediately injured that, you know, they've got the ability to start doing some cardio training. Um, I like to really start with base building, right? I, I really, you know, even, even for someone like me who trains a lot, remember 80% of my training volume is at zone two. Uh, only, only 20% of my training volume is, is, is in that VO2 max range. Um, and, and again, I, I've said this before, but I, it's always worth reiterating understand that I am not training for anything other than the, the sport of life. If I were still training to be an athlete, if I were still training to be a cyclist, I would have to do something very different than what I'm stating. What, I, what I'm stating is far less intensive than someone who's, you know, trying to be a master's level athlete in, you know, pick your endurance sport. Um, so again, now we're talking about a person who's new to this. What are we going to do? I would be really happy if I could get them to start two days a week, 30 minutes a time. Now, if I took a person who was re relatively fit and we did two times a week at 30 minutes per session, they're not going to improve enough, right? They're, they're going to experience no improvement. If I reduced my training volume to that level, I would probably go backwards. But you have to remember when you're starting with a person who's very deconditioned, they will actually see a training benefit at such low volume. So, you know, I'm not going to throw them in three hour, four hour a week training. Um, we're going to start them much lower. Now, the question I get asked all the time is how do you help that individual calculate where their zone two is? And this is worth spending some time on. Again, for folks who want a bit of a primer, when we talk about zone two, we are not talking about the same zone two that shows up on your polar heart rate or your Apple watch or whatever other device you're talking about. We're talking about um, a very specific mitochondrial level of zone two. And it's, it's, it's referring to an, um, the highest level of work that you can do while keeping lactate at effectively in indefinite steady state, which for most people tends to be below two millimole. So, um, once you're exercising and lactate gets above two, you're probably not going to be able to sustain that for, you know, a couple of hours, which is effectively what we're talking about here. Um, because metabolically you are going to, um, uh, move to an area where you're generating too much hydrogen along with too much lactate and the muscles are going to be compromised. So, um, if, if you really want the gold standard for measuring zone two, you've got to be kind of checking lactate levels. And I don't really advocate that for people, especially if they're starting out, you know, I do it, but I'm probably an outlier here because I enjoy that level of precision. So what I do recommend is two ways to be thinking about this. The first is on the rate of perceived exertion, which I've talked about at length in the past, and that is the talk test. Um, so you know, and I've even posted a video, I think somewhere that we can probably link to in the show notes, showing people what I look like when I'm in zone two and what my, you know, difficulty in, in speaking is. So we'll, we'll link to that so people understand, but because I know that people really like, you know, a little more guidance than that, I think using Phil Maffetone's, um, MAP formula, maximum aerobic performance, I think is what MAP stands for. Um, but it's 180 minus your age is a target heart rate. And then if you're really new to the thing, which again is the audience we're now talking about, you might even subtract 10 from that, right? So a 60 year old is gonna potentially be as low as 110 beats per minute at a target. And as they get fitter, that's probably gonna go a little bit higher. Now I wanna point out that you don't wanna be too wed to this as you get more and more involved in your training. Um, because the fitter you get, I think the more variability you'll experience based on recovery. So my Maffetone formula would have my heart rate be uh, 129, okay? Well, I can tell you 129 is never in zone two for me, except on the worst day. You know, maybe once every two months, I might have a zone two based on lactate where my actual heart rate ends up being 129. It's almost always going to be in the high 130s and sometimes in the low 140s. So 
as you get more conditioned, the formula may be less and less valuable and you will rely more and more on RPE. Or if you really want to, you know, take it to the next level, you might even start using lactate. Final point I say on this, lactate, even if a person is deconditioned, we will, we will not use lactate on them because an individual that's coming in who's metabolically unhealthy tends to have very high resting lactates. In fact, there were people walking around with a lactate of two millimole at rest. Clearly in that person using lactate provides no value and you should rely on heart rate and RPE. And in that person, let's say they're doing two days a week, 30 minutes a day. How long do you like to see that consistency before you slowly increase either the duration or the number of days? You know, in part, it comes down to what we talked about, which is like, how do they feel? You know, I almost want to, uh, you know, inspire within them an appetite to do a little bit more. Um, so, you know, I mean, this sounds silly, but when you're starting out some of this stuff, a lot of it is just the growing pains of being able to sit on a bike and your butt doesn't hurt or being able to walk on a treadmill and making sure that their knees aren't aching or things like that. You know, so, um, the, the, you know, I, I would say within eight weeks to 12 weeks, I would want to start pushing frequency and or duration. Uh, I, I personally, and I don't think there's a right answer here. And if there is, I'm sure someone will comment. I like to push frequency before I push duration. Um, so I'd almost rather go from two to three to four sessions at 30 minutes before we start going to 45. Um, but eventually I'm going to want the sessions to be at least 45 minutes each. And on the other side of cardiorespiratory VO2 max, before we get into how you start to build that in for people, we do have a few other graphs here that I think are insanely helpful in looking at why VO2 max is so important as people age. And so I'll pull them up here, but do you want to kind of talk viewers and listeners through this side of it as well? Yeah, this was, this was a graph that I was able to get into the book. So I was, uh, I fought hard for this one because boy, nobody wanted this one in a, in a book and, and I can understand why it requires some explanation. So, um, this is, this is a figure that shows the hazard ratio of various comorbidities and performance subgroups. So again, what's a hazard ratio? Well, it gives you an estimate of relative risk. So let's start with the comorbidities because I think that's easier to understand, right? So if a person is a smoker, are they at increased risk? And in this case, the risk is all-cause mortality. So they are, are, they, are they at an increased risk of death from all causes? I think anybody would understand the answer to that question is obviously yes. The question is how much? And in this analysis, if you compare a smoker to a non-smoker and ask the question, what is the probability of that smoker dying in the coming 12 months from any and all causes, the answer is it's 41% greater than the non-smoker. Okay, that kind of makes sense. Uh, what if you take two people, one with coronary artery disease, known CAD, and the other without? Well, it's about a 29% difference in all-cause mortality. 29% greater risk, I should say, if I'm going to be more accurate. What about somebody with type 2 diabetes? Well, again, it's a 40% greater risk of all-cause mortality in the coming year. High blood pressure, 21%. End-stage renal disease, right? So somebody who's on dialysis awaiting kidney transplant, a whopping 178% increase in all-cause mortality. So now what we do is we do the same mortality analysis on that massive cohort of people for whom we have VO2 max data. So these are the data that we showed earlier where we looked at people in those uh, quartiles. And so um, what I do every time I run a patient through their VO2 max the first time is I figure out where they are. And if somebody, let's just say somebody shows up and they're um, in the below average camp. Um, so that means they're in the 25th to 50th percentile for their age. I say, look, if you just go from below average to above average, right? If I were just to compare you from, you know, your level at the 25th to 50th percentile to someone who's in the 50th to 75th percentile, the hazard ratio is 1.41. In other words, 
you are 41% more likely to die in the coming year than somebody who is that much fitter than you. And by the way, it's not it's not lost on anybody that that's the exact same hazard ratio of a smoker to a non-smoker. That's how big the difference is. And if you want to go from below average to high, so now you're going from, say, the second quartile to the third quartile, it's a 100% difference in risk. It's a doubling of the risk of death for that coming decade. I won't go through the rest of these numbers here, but they're all staggering. Um, and by the way, even just going high to elite, 29% difference in relative risk. So, you know, when I talk about how VO2 max is the single most important biomarker we have for lifespan, these are the data from which I make that claim, right? And, and there are obviously other data that are identical to this on different cohorts. But the point is, there aren't other biomarkers that will give you hazard ratios of this magnitude. Um, now, people often ask, why is that the case? And I think the answer is that VO2 max is probably a remarkable integrator of work. So it is not a biomarker that changes quickly and easily to the magnitudes required to do this, right? Um, you know, you're not going to take your VO2 max from low to elite in a year. Um, you can do it. I would argue you absolutely can do it, but it's not going to happen in a year. And therefore, when it happens, it's going to reflect an astronomical volume of work that has been done. And the benefits of that work are what are being captured in the VO2 max number. Uh -huh.